Alright Oggy, today we're going to find the best 55 to 58 mm vintage lens. It will show an alternative to the Helios 44-2, where the winner will be hard to determine. It's a conundrum. Furthermore, all three lenses are more expensive than the Helios. It's a conundrum. Not to mention, it will be another very long detailed vintage review. It's a con Stop saying conundrum, you goblin-faced sewage troll. You probably overheard it at the unemployment office. You don't even know what the word means. Sure I know. Oh really? How about you enlighten us what it means? It's if you have a piece of corn stuck in your condom. Augie, you're the stupidest man I've ever met. Your IQ is so low, it could be dangling between the legs of a geriatric. The only reason why you have a head is to prevent random people to shit down your neck. The Zeiss Jena Biota 58mm f2. The Maya Optic Girl It's Primo Plan 58mm f1.9. The Steinheil München Otto Quinon 55mm f1.9. All of these have a better image quality than the Helios 44, which has the visual clarity of a lens that has been wiped on an alcoholic's balls. Now we all understand the Helios is the first lens you get when you run out of cash. But ultimately, you want to buy a lens for long term. But which should you buy? First up is this 58mm Carl Zeiss Jena Biota F2. The earlier 17 bladed version. Or is it better than the Helios? The Helios is a less sharp, less bladed Russian copy of the later less sophisticated, less bladed version of the Biota. It's a knockoff of a budget model. The Biota, however, has the physical look and feel of a Victorian gentleman's clock, precisely letting you know when to take the next opium hit. The focus turn is very smooth and surprisingly long for such a small lens. Also, while it is made in the late 1940s, I made sure to buy a copy that is optically virtually new. Most Biota reviews are hazy copies of the later 50s version. The aperture ring is declicked and gives you enough resistance to not accidentally stop up or down. The advantage of 17 aperture blades, you can stop down and still have smooth bokeh. No octagonal or ninja star bokeh nonsense. Be ready to buy an exact amount adapter from China that will take a while to arrive. The following footage has been shot with the Biota 58mm f2. At the first look, you will be quite surprised how the lens is relatively sharp at medium distances. The colors are as full as the 6 month old cheeks of a 60 year old trophy wife. And the field curvature that blurs the sides while highlighting the center are as round as a millennial's waistline. In short, this lens has character while still good center sharpness. This is what a biota looks like when not hazy and moldy. Next up is the Maya Optic Girl It's Primo Plan 58mm f1.9 in optically mint condition. The focus pull on the Primo Plan is very smooth and easy. As easy as a lady with chest tattoos and long nails. As easy as a simp on a webcam site talking to an Eastern European crime lord pretending to be a virgin from Moscow. In short, it's very easy to turn. That also includes the declicked aperture. However, the aperture is smooth enough that it can be accidentally moved. As for the aperture blades, the Primo Plan has 14 blades, making it still very smooth in bokeh when stopped down. It's the later version that was made till 1959. The earlier version from 1952 has issues finding an ND filter at 39.5mm, with the later version can take standard 49mm filters. The following footage has been shot with the Primo Plan 58mm f1.9. Unlike the Biotar, the bokeh of the Primo Plan has no resemblance to the Helios, which is not a bad thing since the bokeh is fantastic looking as well. In a matter of fact, the painterly bokeh style is the reason why people buy the Primo Plan, with it being considered one of the most beautiful renderings of any 58mm. It has very nice center sharpness, and the light passes through differently being a 5 element lens instead of the 6 elements that are in the Biotar design. The Primo Plan is as painterly as an Italian explaining why the seatbelt on a Ferrari just fell off. The next lens is the Steinhal München Auto Queen on 55mm f1.9. This as well is in virtually almost new condition with no haze or mold. The housing of this lens is incredibly well made and has possibly the smoothest focus pulling on any lens I've used. 
Nylon size planners and a size odors. So I'm not comparing it to plastic cannon and Sigma lenses that are as smooth as an insult asking for Hooker's number. The Auto Quinon is a six element lens like the Biota, but has only seven aperture blades. How the bokeh will look like step down, we will see later. Interestingly, the aperture is not declicked, so keep that in mind if that's important to you. Furthermore, this is the ultra rare first version from 1955. Unlike the Biotern and Primo plan, the Auto Quinon is a West German lens and supposedly rumored to have engineering connections to Leica. This lens has some weird stop down housing attached to the side. For digital use, the stop down housing is as productive as a Valentine's Day gift from a Twitch streamer. The following footage has been shot with the Auto Quinon 55mm f1.9. The image quality resembles the Biotur in rendering style, except that it has one feature that is ahead of the Biotur and Primo plan. The Auto Quinon is exceptionally sharp in the center, with a lot of contrast and color vibrancy, especially for a vintage lens. The secret of its exceptional resolution for a 50s lens? The glass may be radioactive. The internet isn't too clear about that, but with only six elements, one can't really have another explanation for its sharpness. My kindergarten teacher told me that my face looks like it melted in Chernobyl. Augie, why do you keep on talking about your life story? No one cares. I want to leave a legacy. What? Do you think someone will write a book about you named Spare, Parts for Mangled Goblins? If you shoot for the moon, you hit a star. If only we could shoot you into the sun. First up, it's the Biotar. Even wide open, in the center it's quite sharp. The colors are great and contrasty. Then again, most old lenses are sharp close up. F2.8 to F4 look fantastic as well. Plenty sharp for even modern needs. The Primo plan is also surprisingly sharp wide open. And contrasty as well. Again, we are dealing here with premium vintage stuff without hazen mold. However, one can see that from f1.9 to f4, the rendering style is quite different. And now we get to the Auto Quinon. I have to repeat myself like a chatty stuttering guy with Tourette syndrome. But again, excellent center sharpness, colors and contrast from f1.9 to f4. But when we put them next to each other, we can see the Auto Quinon renders light differently. There also is a difference in focus falloff compared to the Biotar and Primo plan. One can speculate that it might be because of the possible radiation in the lens. But now we come to bokeh balls, also known as bubble bokeh or photographer's rash. This is the Biotar's party trick. With 17 aperture blades, the balls are as round and smooth as a bikini wax accident, regardless if f2, f2.8 or f4. What about the Primo plan? I would say at f1.9 the bubble bokeh looks as good as the Biotar's while having its own style. I did notice that the Biotar is more contrasty in color. Nevertheless, even at f4 the Primo plan has attractive bokeh balls with its 14 aperture blades. And now the Auto Quinon. The bokeh balls have more sharper contours at f1.9 than either the Biotar or Primo plan. At f2.8 the balls are already as lopsided as our retired adult star, and at f4, those seven aperture blades produce the expected octagonal shapes. When putting them next to each other, one can see that wide open they're not that far apart from each other. Although at f2.8 and f4, it's the Biotar and the Primo plan, where the center looks very similar. I would say that the Biotar looks cleaner overall, and that at f4, bokeh wise, you want the Biotar. Now we're looking at the bokeh. F2, the Biotar has a clear swirl, although it doesn't work against the subject. Which I think is a good thing if you don't want the bokeh to be as distracting as sitting on a pike. F2.8 and F4 still look good but not really distinguished. The Pimo plan wide open seems to have less of a swirl because of a very attractive water drop pattern. An impressionist's wet dream under a moist cloud of liquid hopes flowing to the river of Queen Aqua, the mistress of waves. At f2.8 and f4, there's a slight swirl. The Auto Quinon at f1.9 seems to have a strong swirl due to its sharp edges of the mini cat's eye bokeh circling at the edges. A very attractive stained glass pattern. At f2.8 and f4, it doesn't look that different from the Biotar or Primo plan. 
As for center sharpness comparison, at wide open the Auto Quinon has the edge, while the Biota with its more contrast looks sharper than the Primo Plan, which also has more of a vintage Leica glow. At f2.8 and f4 there isn't much of a real world difference in sharpness between all three of them. When comparing the swirl with each other, there seems to be a very interesting conclusion. It could very well be that they all have the same swirl, but the bokeh style decides on how accentuated the swirl will look like. And if you don't care about swirl, you may want to decide which bokeh style is more pleasant to you, since you want the background to be a complement to your story instead of being a distraction. Now we get to lens breathing. Let's make this a lot more simple. They all have the same focus breathing. The edges do shift, but it's not the end of the world. We might as well go back and talk about bokeh swirl. Basically, if you want maximum bokeh swirl, and bokeh is all you really care about and nothing more, you go and buy the Helios 44-2 and ride into the sunset with a one-trick pony. It's 80 bucks for your swirl, and the 44-2 has the most swirl of any Helios 44. The other versions have slightly fewer swirl, and I'm assuming therefore less swirl than the Biota, Primo Plan, or Autoquinon. Again, the lenses in this review are for people that want a good Helios alternative that perform well other than just the swirl. Resolution and build quality are as desperately needed in the vintage world as ethics are in a pizza party hosted by the World Economic Forum. Now some of you might say, Weird filmmaker, why didn't you buy a good copy of the Helios 44-2 for $100 and include it in your comparison? First of all, you're one greedy son of a bitch not being happy with 1,700 Canadian dollars worth of lenses being reviewed for free right in front of you. Second of all, we all know the Helios 44-2 is a rush copy of the Biota. Why would I buy a Helios 44-2 that after the review would have the resale value of a brittle nudie magazine? Not to mention the 44-2 quality control out of the factory is as consistent as a chubby westerner exercising. Buying an old Helios 44 in mint condition from an Eastern European country where the main industry is exporting mail order brides has the same statistical consistency of Hollywood producing a good movie. So in this case, it makes more sense looking at the average 44.2 online from different users that have a clean image, and then cross-reference the image. It saves me a hundred bucks to put towards a lens that I actually want to keep in the future. Okay, so to summarize, for the focus breathing, there is some focus breathing, but it's no big deal. 99% of viewers don't care. So stop shitting your pants, nerd. Now we get to focus pulling. The Biota is very easy to pull focus on, which is very fascinating it being such a small lens. A lot of it has to do with the good resistance on the pull itself. That resistance makes the turning very predictable, helping with your timing when pulling focus. The focus pull is also quite long for such a small lens, so overall pulling manual focus will be easier than on modern autofocus lenses. The people plan turns very easy and precise as well. However, there's a little potential fly in the helical grease ointment. The focus pull turns the other way, Nikon style, which if you're not used to it, could be a problem. However, focus pulling isn't rocket science, and with some practice, it's easy to readjust. It has slightly less resistance than the Biota, but everything else is very controllable. And now we get to the Auto Quinon. It has the smoothest, easiest, controllable focus pull here. It turns the regular way, aka the Canon way, and the pull resistance is as exquisite as the mechanism on a steampunk egg mixer built by Captain Nemo. The position on the focusing is user friendly, so too many errors in focusing can only be blamed on the user. But all of this won't matter until we see how human subjects get seen. Or in this case, Augie, a medieval imp whose legends has it, lost his trouser turnip. We're going to start with wide distances. At f2, the Biota has very vintage look with lower contrast and sharpness. At f2.8 and f4, the contrast and sharpness comes back. Which is to be expected. For more artistic shots of environments, f2 is definitely the way to go. Same with the Primo plan. Although it seems to be slightly sharper than the Biota at that distance, at f2.8 and f4 it predictably looks more modern. Where things get more interesting is with the Auto Quinon. Far away wide open, it's actually still fairly sharp in contrast in the center. 
Yes, the sides still have the vintage look, but that is what you want ideally when you want to isolate the subject from the background. When compared against each other, you can see the difference. The biota at the time did have more sunlight, but it doesn't take away that it still gets its teeth kicked in against the Pimo plan and Autocrinon when it comes to sharpness and contrast. But now it's time to look at medium distances. The biota wide open shows that the field curvature distorts the sides, giving a 3D effect as if the center is getting pushed forward. I know for a fact that the sack of sand is on the same level as the sack of shit in the center. The sharpness in this medium distance is quite good while maintaining the vintage character. At f2.8 there's still some distortions on the sides, but the heavy vignetting disappears. At f4 it looks fairly good for even modern standard. I would say it looks better than modern lenses, since then the skin tones don't look like a troll's taint. The Primo Plan wide open has a slight glow. While still having center sharpness, it has more of a vintage effect than the Biotar. It does have the heavy vignetting as well at f1.9. At f2.8 the vignetting disappears and it follows the same pattern as the Biotar in 2f4. Look at Augie. He looks like an alcoholic catfish who found out that his halibut kids aren't his. But that's what happened when he sims to a fat flounder. My point is, F4 looks modern. Now we get to the Auto Queenon. Wide open, it has very good center sharpness, but the sides are actually even more distorted than the Biota or Pimo plan. Which is great since extra center sharpness and added edge distortion will create more of a stark contrast for the 3D effect. Corner to corner sharpness only matters for landscape stuff and nerdy graphs of brick walls. However, you have to make sure to arrange your composition accordingly. At f2.8 and f4, things go towards modern look again, blah 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 blah. So what happens when we compare them next to each other? Interestingly, wide open, the Autocrinon has less bokeh than the Biota and Primo plan. Granted, a 58mm would have more bokeh than a 55mm, but still 3mm don't make that much of a difference. And yes, since I am using a GH5S with a Metabons XL speed booster, they are actually 67mm and 63mm, but the point still stands. With Auto Queen on, you are losing some bokeh, but you are gaining an immense amount of detail and contrast. However, which is more important will be up to you. Now we get to medium close-up, the distance you would actually use these lenses on actors. The key here is skin tones, and the major selling point for vintage lenses. You see, even though Augie's skin looks like an orange peel, the skin texture actually looks flattering for what it is. If this would be a modern lens, his skin would look like a dried leftover clay at a drug rehab clinic on Craft Wednesday. Even F4 has pleasant skin tones on the Biotar, so that should make you think twice about modern lenses for actors. Now we get to the Primo plan. Wide open, it also has good skin textures. Consider this, you have a 5 element lens of the Pimo plan. Add the 6 elements with the speed booster, technically another element with the ND filter, and you have a sharp enough lens with functional 7 elements giving you aesthetic rendering that hasn't over filtered light to a sterile degree, like a modern lens with 13 elements that still needs an ND filter and a softening filter just to make the image somewhat pleasant. You get my point. And now the Auto Quinon. I would say, of all the lenses here, wide open, this is the best option for skin tones. You have enough detail and sharpness for wondering if the artist skimped on eBay while having pleasant rendering. The bokeh style has character without distracting the viewer in this ADD culture, and colors are vibrant. And in f2.8 and f4, the resolution looks modern, while the texture and skin tones don't look like they have been pushed along a cheese grater. Which is not what you can say about Augie. He's so hideous, every time he plays Mortal Kombat, Scorpion tells him, stay over there. But what happens if we compare them next to each other? Auto Quinon has the nicer, more flattering rendering, even though it's wider. The Pimo Plan has the better, smoother bokeh, and the Biota has better light and colors. More of the same in F2, however in F4, it will be tricky to decide what style you want to go with. Resolution-wise, they all look modern, but have that different kind of flavor that can be recognized visually, but harder to summarize on paper. And in this example, it shows how close you can go to the subject. The Auto Quinon is the clear winner here, having an almost semi macro ability, followed by the Primo Plan, followed by the Biotar. There are some photo samples shot with the Lumix G9 and Metabons XL on natural mode at 400 ISO. 
There's a big blue-haired pierced elephant in the room with tattoos that everyone wants to ignore. It is the fact that all three lenses have almost identical colors in pictures, while they differ in video. The reason is that in the real world you add an ND filter, which reacts differently with each lens design. A little fact people tend to overlook when buying lenses for video. However, you might ask, how would these lenses perform in a cinematic scene like environment? Well, let's take a look. So this established that all three lenses are better than any Helios 44. But which of those three will be the best? The one to get? Place number three, the Zeiss Jenner Biotar 58mm f2, superior to the Helios 44 2 in every metric. The classic Coke, the Polish RC Cola, the English Wit, the German Charm. It is the best version of a Helios that you can get. Who knew that the original German version is better than a copy made in a Soviet factory where the prettiest town ladies look like they work at a slaughterhouse? Run up on place 2, and this was a close one, the Maya Optic Girlitz Primoplan 58mm f1.9. The resolution matches the biota, but bokeh is more appealing, the perfect lens for dream or vision sequences, and close-ups where you want the most artistic bokeh available. And since it's not that well known, it will stick out among the massive sea of Heliuses. But the winner ultimately has to be the Steinhall München Autoquinon 55mm f1.9. Did I pick it because it's a lens almost impossible to buy in virtually new condition, making my copy super exclusive? That is part of it. But primarily its sharpness, its rendering, its texture and supreme build quality makes it a lens that is more than a sum of its parts. Because vintage has class and style. A rare commodity in today's times where everyone aspires to become substandard narcissists, known as online influencers. Oggy, you wouldn't know class and style since your dermatologist sent you to a proctologist for skincare. I can't afford preparation each. That's because you get out-earned by a gumball machine. Or ducks that are accidentally fed quarters. True. How you miss the low bar of social media is beyond me. I would make a fantastic influencer. I would agree with you, but then we both would be wrong. I think I have a certain X factor. Because words can't describe your looks. But luckily numbers can. It's one out of ten.